Coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Whalen Bailey. You don't give up because the circumstances of life turn against you. And you don't give up because there are persecutions. And you don't give up because of those who speak falsehood and live according to the ways of man, but not according to the ways of God. You redouble your efforts. You keep on doing that which you've been called to do. You remain faithful in service for God. is the last writing of Paul. He's writing to Timothy, and he's encouraging him on how to go on and how to be faithful. And you and I need, we need to know how to live faithfully. We need to know what to do in the midst of persecution. We need to know what to do in perilous times that Paul is talking about. So let's hear from God's Word. It is, it is 2 Timothy chapter 3, And beginning in verse 10, you find that he is writing about about what happens. There will be terrible times in the last days. And he describes some of that. But he's not talking about that. He's talking to Timothy. Timothy, what should you do? Here's what he says. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my endurance, my persecutions and sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. But listen to these hopeful words. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You don't live godly lives without living disciplined lives. Now, I'm not talking about rules, and I'm not talking about regulations, and I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about discipline. There's a tremendous difference between the two. You don't live a godly life by showing up on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock and kind of drifting through the worship service. You don't live godly lives. You don't become like Jesus by thinking about it one time a week. No, there has to be discipline. And there has to be a desire for it. And there has to be a, a working at it. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy to do. Now, he wasn't thinking that Timothy hadn't been there. He wasn't thinking that Timothy was not on the right track. None of that. You go back to Philippians. Paul says, I don't have anybody like Timothy. He's different from everybody else around me. And he talked about how Timothy did not think only about himself, but he thought about other people. He didn't think only about himself, but he thought about the church as a whole and the ministry of the church, and he wanted the best. So Paul thought so highly of Timothy. And what he is doing here is just writing, saying, Timothy, this is how you do it. You're on the right track. Don't quit. Don't give up. 
That's what I want to say to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't quit. Paul had been in prison at least three times for two years each time. He was in Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea, and he was there for a full two years. He could never get anybody to, to hear his case and to give a verdict. They kept passing him from place to place. They then sent him to Rome. He was shipwrecked across the, along the way. And he goes to Rome, and for two years, he is under house arrest. As far as we know, he was released at that point. And for maybe a couple of more years, he was free. Then arrested again, and it was in this third imprisonment that Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy, to Titus, and then to 2 Timothy, in which he is giving them instructions and giving them encouragement. And Paul is saying, don't quit. That's what I want to say to the church in perilous times. By the way, chapter 3, verse 1, here's what Paul said, but mark this. That's his way of saying, remember these words. There will be terrible times in the last days. By the last days, Paul means that period between the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus and the time he comes again. Paul didn't tell us how long that was going to be. According to what Jesus said, Paul didn't know how long that was going to be. It's been 2,000 years to this point. It may go on for another day. It may go on for 2,000 more years. But Paul says that there will be treacherous seasons in the last days. It just feels to me, maybe to you, that we're in one of those treacherous seasons. And maybe it's one of those times that tells us that the Lord is coming very soon. But what Paul wanted them to know is, is that you don't give up because it's a treacherous time. You don't give up because the circumstances of life turn against you. And you don't give up because there are persecutions. And you don't give up because of those who speak falsehood and live according to the ways of man but not according to the ways of God. You don't give up then. No, you do what Paul said. You redouble your efforts. You keep on doing that which you've been called to do. You remain faithful in service for God. So I see four things here. I hope that you will follow along. The first one is this. He is telling Timothy to follow the good examples he's had in the past. Now we know that Timothy... Uh, was raised by a mother and a grandmother who were godly examples. We, we even know their names, Eunice and Lois. His mother and his grandmother who read him Holy Scripture and from whom he heard about God. And when Paul came along in the first missionary journey, about A.D. 48, Timothy was a young man and was saved on that first missionary journey. Then Paul went back to Antioch of Syria, where he'd come from, and he stayed about a year. He went down to Jerusalem. There was the Jerusalem Council. He took a second missionary journey, and he went back to Central Asia Minor, the middle of Turkey where Antioch and Iconium and Lystra were. And Timothy now is a young man, and Paul invites him to come with Silas and to be a part of the missionary journey. And from that point on, Timothy was with Paul again and again, faithfully serving with Paul in doing the work of ministry. So Paul said, you've had good examples. Your mother, your grandmother. But Paul gives himself as an example. Look at, look at verse 10. You know all about my teaching, my doctrine, my way of life, my pattern of living. 
my purpose to preach the gospel, to take it to the Gentiles, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my endurance, my persecution and sufferings. And Paul makes a reference to the first missionary journey, Acts 13 and 14, where he says, you know what happened to me in Antioch? You know what happened to me in Iconium? You know what happened to me in Lystra? Lystra was Timothy's hometown. You know what I endured? Let those be your example. Isn't it amazing how often we are afraid to be an example? Paul was a humble man, but he also knew that God had called him for a purpose. You and I need to be people who can tell our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our neighbors, let me teach you how to pray. Let me show you living that pleases God. Nobody's saying I got everything perfect, I've got it all figured out, and I know everything. Paul says, not that I've attained, when he wrote to the church of Philippi, not that I've obtained everything, But, he gets to the end of the next chapter in Timothy. Paul says, I fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day and to all who love his appearing. We need to be determined that that as best we can, we're going to learn all that we can of God. We're going to learn about prayer, and we're going to learn about Scripture, and we're going to learn about righteousness and justice and godly living, and we're going to be an example for other people because that example is something you can't get anywhere else, and it's something that it gives you things that you can't find anywhere else. I, I had almost no examples when God called me to preach I had no examples except the guy who was in the pulpit preaching which was a great example for me but I had no others there's nobody in my church who served the church there's nobody in my church who who had ever done anything like this before I had no example my mom and dad basically hadn't seen much of it either and they they couldn't tell me much about it Uh, my mom did give me a few things to say she said Short sermons are better than long sermons. She said a few other things that just don't fit today, but they're great things that she gave to me and and meaningful things that she gave to me. But I had no example. And then I went to Samford University, a Baptist school in Birmingham, and my first day there, I walked into a classroom on the Bible, and a man by the name of Sigurd Brian was there, since passed away. He was a man of such humble faith, and he knew the Bible. He, he had a degree in Old Testament. He knew the Bible, and I, I could not get enough of what he had to give and could not get enough of the Scripture. And I left there, and I went to New Orleans Seminary, And I met an Old Testament professor by the name of Olin Strange who wound up being my friend. We used to commute back and forth to the seminary. And he he had been in World War II, so he was old enough almost to be my grandfather. uh, But what a great man he was. And he, he was a humble man who knew the Scripture. And those two became my examples We all need those godly examples. They were my examples. And they have blessed me. Both have have died a long time ago, and they have blessed me with what they gave. Paul says, follow, find godly examples and be like them. Be like Christ. Do the things of God. Live godly lives. A second thing that we need to do is we must, we must seek the truth and we must live the truth. 
Notice, notice what Paul says here. And all of this comes right out of Scripture. I want you to see it. But as for you, verse 14, he is talking about what has happened. But Timothy, as for you, verse 14, continue in what you have learned from Scripture, in faith. Keep on with what you have learned. Don't get to the point in life where you say, well, you know, I've done enough. Time for me to quit. There's no quit in the Bible. There's no end of the time. You get 65, you you stop doing the work of ministry. No, we, we give it, we make it lifetime. We make it lifelong. That is, long as God gives us breath, we seek to serve him. So continue. In what you've learned. Paul could have said, comes pretty clear what he meant. Paul could have said, I'm not going to be here, Timothy. You keep on. You keep doing. Continue in what you've learned. Continue in what you've become convinced of. Continue with the truth and seek truth. We live... Think about this. We live in a world that is full of knowledge. And it's right here in your, on your fingertips. We have such amazing knowledge at our, foot, at our fingerprints. We can find most anything. All, even to the point where kids are saying, trying to convince you, I really don't need to learn my multiplication tables because I've got a calculator and I can figure it out. We have the knowledge, but we are desperate for the truth. And we don't have the truth. Because we determine that we're going to live for ourselves and we leave God out. You have to seek truth. Truth comes from God. God is the creator of the universe. I read the other day, scientists have been mistaken about how many galaxies there are. They thought that there are 100 billion galaxies. Or maybe it's just a billion. Here a billion, there a billion. I don't know how you do this. (laughs) But they said we think we're wrong and we think there are only one-fourth. So what? 250 million galaxies. And if any of those numbers are right, God created every one. And God knows everything about us. And God knows not just everybody here, but the six or seven billion people who are alive around the world right this very minute. Paul says, seek truth. And if you want to live a disciplined life, if you want to live a life that makes sense, if you want to live a life that has significance, you will seek the truth and you will seek the truth by seeking God. A third thing to do, we cannot let circumstances and persecution overwhelm us. Paul is the poster child for that. Because Paul has gone through those three long times of imprisonment. And Paul was facing death. Read chapter 4. It is very clear. And we know that it came. And we know from history that it came under the hands of Nero, who was as much of a despot and as much as a heinous individual as any person who has ever lived. Nero, you go back and read the history of Nero He was an evil man who hated the things of God. And he had Paul executed, beheaded him. Peter, about the same time, crucified. Paul says, don't let the circumstances and the persecutions get you down. Don't let them overwhelm you. And you and I both know that it is easy to let the things that happen in life and easy to let the persecutions and easy to let the things that people say 
and easy to let the, th the things that people publish to overwhelm us. But that's what Paul is saying. Don't you know that the person who seeks to live a godly life will be persecuted? Have you ever wondered why is it that only Christianity is looked down as being an evil religion? Why not Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam? That evil hates the light loves the darkness and hates the light. Don't let circumstances and don't let persecutions get you down. In this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation, but, but be happy, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Paul says, we know that all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Don't let them get you down. i got two truths for you. Number one is on your sermon sheet. It is too soon to quit. So don't quit. It's too soon to quit. And this whole book is about it's too soon to quit. Don't give up. Don't quit. I, I always I want to talk to teenagers, young men and young women. Don't quit. Don't let the world get you down. Don't let the circumstances get you down. Be determined. Be sure. I will live for God. If no one lives for God, I will live for God. It's too soon to quit. The second truth is this. It's always too soon to give up on God. Don't give up on God. Don't let the circumstances and the persecutions of life get you down. The fourth thing that we need to do to be disciplined is we need to emphasize God and we need to emphasize his word. And that's what Paul is saying here in verses 15 and 16 about discipline. You cannot, you, we need biblical Christians. If you're not a biblical Christian, then you go off in any direction you want to go. Whatever feels good, whatever you think is right, whatever makes people around you happy and like you, then that's your faith. You can't be that. It has to be the Word of God. It is God's Word. He has given it to us. He is speaking to us. This is His Word. He has spoken to you. If you want to hear God's word and obey this word, why would you, why would God speak to you? Because you've already demonstrated that you're not going to be faithful and not going to be obedient. Why would God speak to you if you won't hear what he has to say? So how do we emphasize? And what does the Bible say about this? Well, we, we understand that God's word is sacred. That's why we call it Holy Scripture. Look at verse 15, and Paul says, Timothy, I know how you from infancy have known the Holy Scriptures. Literally, the Greek says the sacred writings. Sacred means that which is separate, that which is set apart, that which is different. And when the, the Bible, my, my cover says the Holy Bible it means that it is different from any other writing. It is different from any other book. It is sacred scripture. And we should think of it as holy scripture, set apart the word that comes from God and is to be followed. A second thing that you can say about God's word is, is that it leads us to salvation. How from infancy you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. Paul doesn't say the scripture saves you. Doesn't say you read the scripture and you'll be saved. No, the scripture makes you wise for salvation which comes through faith in Christ. The Bible is God's way to make himself known to you, to speak to you, but that, that salvation comes by faith in Christ. It comes when you say to God, God, I want to follow you. I want to live for you. I want to serve you. I want you in my life. I give myself to you. What does God's word do? It, it's true and it's dependable. Verse 16, all scripture is God breathed. 
It comes from God himself. It is his word. Even those parts I don't understand, even those parts I, well, I'm not quite sure how do I explain this to somebody, even those parts, all of these are God-breathed. It is God's word speaking to us. It is true and dependable. You can count on it. How could it be that a book 2,000 years old still speaks to us and still has relevance and maybe, maybe has more relevance than it has ever had because we live in such a dark and, and, and rebellious time. We live in that day and God's word speaks to us and it is true and it is dependable. God's word is profitable. It helps us. So that we're, we're able to teach and rebuke and correct and train in righteousness. And that rebuking is not trying to find everybody we can tell what to do. It is, it is spoken in love. Two, two men would do it this way. A guy puts his arm on my shoulder and he says, Waylon, we need to think about that differently. You speak the truth in love. That's, that's what he means by rebuking. Every now and then, maybe you really do have to rebuke somebody, but the number of times you have to do that in a whole lifetime wouldn't, wouldn't fit on one hand. No, we, we speak the truth in love, and we, we speak like a pastor to his people of, of this is what God wants us to know, and we, we need to live that life. It's profitable. It equips us for service so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Timothy, that's you. Do it, man. It's what God has called you to do. Be faithful. And God's word is to help us live. Because life will be hard. There will be circumstances. There will be persecutions. But God's word will help you. It will give you guidance. It will give you encouragement. It will give you a sense of peace and joy because it comes from God, because God breathes through it and gives it to us. Don't quit. Don't give up. But be faithful by living a life of service and devotion unto God. Live on the North Shore or planning to visit? Join us here at First Baptist Church Covington for one of our three weekend services. Come be encouraged by Dr. Bailey every Saturday evening at 6 or Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11 a.m. For more information and directions to our church, visit fbccov.org. First Baptist Church Covington. Experience life-changing relationships. Be sure to tune in again next week for Foundation for Life.